Hello and welcome back to Student of the Gun Homeroom. I am your favorite professor, Paul Markle, and today we're going to talk about the UN Arms Treaty, or the recent arms treaty that was just passed by the UN General Assembly. And thanks to the encouragement of our dear leader, the U.S. representative voted for it. And what does it mean to you, or what does it potentially mean to you? And you say, well, you know, I don't own tanks or jet airplanes or international or intercontinental ballistic missiles, so it doesn't affect me. Ha ha ha. You'd think so. But according to, and as I look down in my uh, little prompt teleprompter here, uh, according to the language, uh, it not only regulates combat vehicles and military aircraft and so forth, but it also regulates ammunition and weapons, parts, and components. And you say, well, how many of you guys really enjoy going out to the range and shooting that inexpensive steel-jacketed Russian-manufactured ammo? A lot of you do, don't you? How about, uh, how many of you enjoy purchasing foreign-made guns, such as those made from Turkey or Russia or China or wherever, and they're imported into the United States. Well, guess what? All of those imports, if the host country, and if we ratify this treaty, if the United States Senate ratifies this treaty and the president signs it, what will happen? Well, all of those inexpensive firearms that you like to purchase because they're inexpensive or they're readily available uh, will be now regulated and restricted by this treaty. Yes, thank you very much. Now, right now in the United States or in the world, it's 2013. And what we've done or what this, this UN arms trade treaty has done is it has essentially put all of the the control over every type of arms not just you know ICBMs and battleships and aircraft carriers but everything all the way down to a cartridge all the way down to a firearms cartridge can now be legitimately regulated by the government because according to the UN only the government should have arms only the government is responsible enough to possess arms and to control arms. You know, think about it. You're watching this probably in the United States of America. And right now, on planet Earth, I can only think of three countries where the government, up till just recently, not only encouraged but supported their citizens possessing arms not the police not the military but actual citizens and they would be israel switzerland and the united states of america now if you live in a european country and you can own guns because you're a member of a gun club and you drive to the gun club and check your gun out of the safe and go shoot it on the range and put it back in the safe and drive back to your house okay you don't count because you can't take your gun home. You can't actually carry your gun. The number of free uh, countries that allow you to actually carry a gun and be an armed citizen are very, very few. The vast majority of nations in the world either strictly limit the ability for you to own a firearm or access to a firearm, or they flat out forbid it. And what does that mean? Well, for instance, in India, they've had gun control for a long, long time. And if you, uh, if you do your research, it's not that hard to find out that in India, because firearms are so restricted, what you have is you have the military and the police that have them. And then your professional bad guys, your gangs, your, uh, you know, your organized crime people, well, if they can't get firearms through normal channels, what do they do? Well, they have them manufactured illegally. One of the big problems that they have in India right now is they have underground firearms manufacturing facilities building untraceable guns that they give to criminals, that criminals use to commit their heinous acts. So on one hand, you have the government that has guns. On the other hand, you have organized crime and gangs and so forth that have guns. And who's in the middle? Well, Johnny Citizen is in the middle, all defenseless, and just holding his hands up saying, please don't harm me. Uh, 
it is not a new part of human history for the government to try and disarm the people. As a matter of fact, that is common. That's the way it always was up until 1776, when we, and then, of course, through the Constitutional Convention, 1787, and so forth, when we ratified the Constitution and said, no, citizens, average citizens, people who are lawful you know, inhabitants of this nation, will have the ability to possess arms because only by possessing arms can they be truly free. If, and there are lots of constitutions in the world. Uh, after 1776, 1787, and so forth, a lot of countries adopted constitutions. You know, they, when they had their own little revolution, they're like, oh, we're going to adopt a constitution. But one of the things that's not in their constitution is the Bill of Rights. They don't have a Bill of Rights that says that each and every citizen can own firearms and is allowed to uh, be armed. And that is the big difference. If you have a constitution and your people are disarmed, it's really just an exercise in, in futility. So, because when it comes down to it, you are a slave. You're like, oh, I'm not a slave. I can do what I want. Look, look. If the government <laughs> disarms you and tells you, uh, I was just talking to a good friend of mine uh, about being a tax slave, and, and he said, um, it, it, they say, well, there's a voluntary tax code in the United States of America, and that's laughable. It's not voluntary. It's forced at the barrel of a gun. You say, well, no, it's not. Ha, huh. try and not pay your taxes for two years. Try and tell the IRS to stick it and see who comes to your house to pull you out and put you in jail. It's going to be a man with a gun. All right? It's not voluntary. It's at the point of a gun. That's where we are. And when you disarm the citizen, then they essentially become tax slaves. And that's it. And it's not new in the history of the world. What the UN is essentially trying to do is trying to reestablish the world prior to the American Revolution when these radicals here in, in the United States of America decided that citizens should be allowed to possess arms. Because up until that point, if you read your history, whether it was feudal Japan or England or wherever, the government strictly controlled arms, whether it's a bow, a lance, a crossbow, a sword, what have you, Throughout human history, it has been the want and desire of organized governments to first and foremost, foremost disarm the peasant. No sort. I mean, it's up till 1776. In most countries, um, you could not own arms or possess arms, and if you did, and you were caught possessing arms, it was punishable by death. The government troops caught you with a sword in your house, and you were done. And that is essentially what the UN, this grand United Nations body and organization, uh, they're trying to reset so that only the governments of the world can possess arms and the citizens of the world can just suck it. So I don't know uh, if you think that's a good idea. I'm pretty much against it. Uh, but the one, th one more thing that you need to think about right now, in the United States, we've got all this gun control jazz going on. And you've got Dianne Feinstein on her big stage, you know, doing her little act. She's got all her props and all her, and her script, and she's got the lunatic script, right? So what do we do as gun owners? We focus on Dianne Feinstein. No, Dianne, you can't have our guns. Well, what's going on while she's rattling the freaking cage over here? Well, while we're focused on Dianne Feinstein being her typical lunatic self, what else is going on? You've got little state governments, state houses, um, doing these 24-hour bills and snapping up the rights of the people. New York, Connecticut, uh, Colorado, you name it. And then you have the United Nations coming around with this UN arms treaty. And if they ratify it, if your Senate ratifies this treaty and the president approves it, what happens? Well, what they can do is they can do the little Pontius Pilate, wash their hands of the whole thing and say, oh, we didn't pass any gun control laws. We just went along with the United Nations because that's reasonable. And so we're not really responsible for disarming you, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, little, uh, little sleight of hand there. Are you paying attention, America? So uh, I would, if I were you, uh, I'm not, but if I were you, I would contact my senator and I would say the answer to the UN arms treaty is no. 
And if you vote for it, I will remember that come next November, and your butt will be gone. Our recommended reading for today is The Battle of New Orleans, or subtitled Andrew Jackson and America's First Military Victory. Uh, this book is actually written by Robert V. Ramini, Robert V. Ramini's ish version of The Battle of New Orleans. Uh, if you recall, if you've been paying attention to Student of the Gun, and shame on you if you haven't, uh, we actually went down to the Chalmette battlefield in New Orleans, and we did a we filmed an episode there. There's also a military cemetery there, and if you go to Student of the Gun TV YouTube, you can watch the Star Spangled Banner video that we did or that we edited from our visit to the battlefield. So check it out. It's called The Battle of New Orleans. It's an easy read. It's only about 220 pages, but it's filled with really interesting information. Now, for all things Student of the Gun, we want you to go to studentofthegun.com. But don't forget, check us out on Facebook. Be our friend. Like us at Student of the Gun on Facebook or at Student of the Gun on Twitter. So check us out. Be our friends and stick with us and come back next time. Mm -hmm.